Hello friends, my name is Lucas Mann. I'm the pastor of the Spring Church. I'm just over here up on 221 near the hot spot in Lawrence. And friends, uh, I come out here this afternoon, or this, this morning I should say, not quite yet past noon, to uh, preach the gospel of grace to you, to bring to you the message of the Lord Jesus Christ, that Jesus saves sinners. I come out here with even a couple of friends of mine who are willing to stand out here, God bless you ma'am, and uh, hold these signs, and, and uh, even even in, contained in those signs is the is some gospel truth. And uh, friends, that's what we're here. That's that's the centerpiece to all this is the the preaching, the spreading, the publication of the gospel, and the exaltation of Jesus Christ as the King, the King of Glory. Friends, we're also here to warn about the wrath of God that's going to come and to come upon the wicked. That time is ticking away. And we're counting down to the day of judgment when God will judge this world in righteousness, when it will be apart from partiality, when God in His holiness will obliterate the wicked, but in His grace He will receive the righteous into His eternal rest in His Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. And so friends, we, we say the flood of God's wrath is coming, but the ark of salvation, the Lord Jesus Christ, has been prepared in the sight of all people. And so you must flee to Him. You must flee your sin. Flee your pride. And come to Christ. Look to the Son of God and live. Have life eternal in Him. For there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved other than the name of Jesus Christ our Lord. And so friends, the text of Scripture that I would like to direct your attention to this morning is out of the book of Romans, in Romans chapter 2, in verse 11. And the text simply reads, For there is no partiality with God. And that is exactly the subject that I would like to consider this morning, to preach to you concerning this morning, the fact that there is no partiality with God, that God in His dealings with the children of men is absolutely perfect and absolutely holy. And it does not matter how much money you have made in this life or what your status is in society or what political rank you hold or what the color of your skin is or what your background is. There is no partiality with God. He will judge the rich and the poor the same. He will judge the righteous and the unrighteous according to the same measure of holiness. God is in every way perfect in His dealings. This is not just the testimony of the book of Romans. This is the testimony of all of Scripture, both Old and New Testaments. Proclaim this reality that God is just in all that He does, holy in His dealings with the children of men. God bless you, ma'am. Here's a, here's a card for our church. I gotta be for them Oh, you're okay. You already have a church. I see. Oh, yeah. I see. I was wanting you to hear the music on channel 90.9. Nine. Oh, 90.9? Uh, 90.9. Nine. Mm. Mm. Here's a gospel track as well. You can give this to a family member or friend. Absolutely. Yep, you have a good afternoon, or good morning. God bless you, ma'am. That sounds like the Gaither vocal band. Faith. Oh, that's awesome. Fantastic. Praise the Lord. Mm. 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 God bless you, ma'am. Mm. So as I was saying, this uh, this concept of God being holy is is not, or, or I should say, not, uh, being just in His judgments and impartial is not something that Paul writes of in Romans. It's not exclusive to Paul's writings, but it is the testimony of all Scripture, both Old and New Testament. In fact, the psalmist said in Psalm 119, 137, he wrote, Righteous are you, O Lord, and upright are your judgments. God in His judgments is in no way wrong. And no man can stay His hand. And no man can resist His will. 
and no man can say unto him, Why have you done this? He is perfect in his dealings with the children of men, holy in every way. He acts according to how his character is, and his character is holy. He is perfect in his being. And therefore, when he judges, his judgments are impartial. Actually, the Bible puts it in in these terms. He is not a respecter of persons. That is, He does not regard you for your accomplishments or for your background or for your money. God judges you in justice. God deals with the sinner in justice. But also, there is another glorious truth that is put forth in Scripture. And that is, for for the believer in Jesus Christ... For the one who looks to Jesus Christ for eternal life, they are not judged by God. They do not undergo judgment. They do not stand before the tribunal of God as a guilty sinner, but as a pardoned saint in the Lord Jesus Christ. As a redeemed child of God, whose salvation has been purchased by the blood of Jesus Christ, In fact, John 3.18 says, He who believes in Him is not judged. He who does not believe has been judged already because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. This is the judgment, that the light has come into the world and men love the darkness rather than the light for their deeds were evil. For the person who repents and believes upon the Lord Jesus Christ They do not undergo the judgment of God. And they are received into heaven forever. But for the wicked, they undergo the just judgment of God. And truly, the scripture is fulfilled which says, It is a terrifying thing to fall into the hands of the living God. See friends, you must have a fear of the Lord of hosts. The children of men must fear God. We we need to fear and reverence our Creator. For He is holy, holy, holy. In fact, the Bible says the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And ultimately, when we fear God and when we reverence Him and we understand His holiness and His justice... Surely then are we ready to see the glorious gospel message brought to our attention. Surely then are we ready to consider the Lord Jesus Christ and what He did in His work at the cross and in His resurrection on our behalf. When we consider that, when we consider those realities, in light of the fact that we've understood that we're sinners in the hands of an angry God, truly then are we ready to receive the message of the gospel and be saved. In fact, to grasp the bad news, or excuse me, to grasp the good news, we must first grasp the bad news. And ultimately, it is that good news that I seek to proclaim to you this morning. That good news of Jesus Christ that I seek to make known to you. That Jesus Christ is Lord. And that He saves from sin. But before we look at this passage itself, and ultimately the gospel message a little later on, I want to consider for a moment the context and what Paul is saying here in Romans 2. He's pointing out the the pride and the guilt of the religious and saying, in effect, to those who thought themselves to be good enough to make it to heaven, you're not good enough. Can I have a 45? Yes, ma'am, absolutely. Hey, John, you got a free Bible? Oops. Okay. He's going to get it. He's got one in his bag. That's Your bag's right here. Okay. She's right here. Thank you. God bless you, ma'am. And John, give her a track, give her a card to the church too. Thank you, brother. Thank you. Mm. 
So here Paul in Romans 2 is, is really he's pointing the, the finger of accusation to the religious and saying that doesn't matter how good you think yourself to be, you need to be saved. You need to be born again. And, and this carries direct application to our day in this effect. It does not matter whether you have gone to church or you're involved in church. You must be born again. You must be saved from your sins. Just because you have a thin veneer of religion does not mean that you have been saved. Salvation is a life-changing miracle of God. How do we know that's what Paul was saying? Well, he says it there in verse 1 of chapter 2. He says, Therefore you have no excuse to every one of you who passes judgment. For in that which you judge another, you condemn yourself. For you who judge practice the same things. Now Paul here is not condemning judging others, but he was condemning their hypocrisy in judging others. Because they looked at other people, they looked at the pagan and said, Oh, they're wicked and they're evil. But they did not look at themselves and say, I'm wicked and I'm evil and I need salvation. In fact, Jesus in his earthly ministry told a story of two people who went up to the temple to pray. One was a tax collector who was one of the most vile wretches in Jesus' day. And then he, he talked about another who was a, a religious leader in Israel. And they went up to the temple and they prayed. And one, the religious leader prayed, God, I thank you that I'm not like the other people, not as bad as they are which is a prideful prayer, and then the tax collector, the vile sinner, prayed, God, have mercy upon me, the sinner. They saw their own sin and their own need for salvation, and so they cried out to God for mercy. And Jesus said that the tax collector went home that day and was justified. And really, that's what Paul is saying here to the religious leaders. You've got to acknowledge your sin. You're just as guilty. You're just as guilty before God because of your sin as the pagan, as the one who does not attend church. And you still need salvation just as desperately as they do. In fact, in verse 6, he says this concerning God. And this, this has great relevance to verse 11, which is what we are considering this morning. He says, who, and he's speaking here of God, who will render to each person according to his deeds. Verse 7, to those by perseverance in doing good seek for glory and honor and immor immortality, eternal life. But to those who are selfishly ambitious and do not obey the truth, but obey unrighteousness, wrath, and indignation, there will be tribulation and distress for every soul of man who does evil, of the Jew first and also of the Greek. But glory and honor and peace to everyone who does good, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. And then that is where we find verse 11. For there is no partiality with God. He will deal justly with all people. And for the righteous, this is, this is something to, to rejoice in, but for the wicked, this is of great terror. This brings great terror and fear to their souls because they must stand before His holy justice. They must stand before the wrath of God and be consumed for their sins. So he says in verse 11, for, he uses that word for there. This is a concluding verse to this section of chapter 2. He is bringing to a close all that he has said, and he sums it up in this very simple sentence. For there is no partiality with God. Notice he says there is no. It's a negative. He says it in a negative form to show us that this is emphatic, that God is not partial in His judgments. You could say in the positive that He is impartial. And so whether one has lived a life of great prestige or has lived a life of great reproach, they both likewise will be dealt with by God in the same manner and fashion. For there is no partiality with God. And this is, a, this is a concept that for us as human beings is hard to grasp because we ourselves are always judging partially. We do not ever exercise perfect judgment, but even in our best moments, even when we think we've exercised the best judgment we possibly could, we know even then that it is an imperfect judgment and we in some way exercised partiality. We in some way exercised a bias. And yet, when we read here, it says there is no partiality, there is no bias with God in His judgments. 
and therefore God cannot be, um, He cannot be bribed. He cannot be bribed by religious performance to pardon you. It is only through the shedding of blood is there forgiveness of sins and not through religious performance. No deeds of righteousness can save you. Paul himself wrote in Romans 3 verse 28, he said, For we maintain that a man is justified by faith apart from the works of the law. Salvation is a free gift of grace. And it is not by the works of the law any man is justified, any woman is justified, any child is justified by God. All free grace. There is no partiality with God. And that last word there in the sentence, God. There is no greater subject that can occupy our minds and our hearts than theology proper, that is, the study of God, who God is, His attributes, His characteristics, His dealings and His workings of the children of men. There is no greater subject that can be upon our hearts and our minds, no greater idea or concept that we can dwell upon than the attributes of God. And right here, verse 11 speaks to one of God's attributes, and that is justice. Just as I read earlier in Psalm 119, God is just in all that He does. His judgments are upright and perfect, and therefore we cannot say anything to Him in terms of questioning His justice. Because we know from Holy Scripture that it is always perfect. In fact, in Romans chapter 11, verse 33, Paul wrote elsewhere, he said, Oh, the depth of the riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God, how unsearchable are His judgments, and unfathomable His ways. Truly, we cannot even grasp to the uttermost God's judgments with the wicked and upon the wicked. Also, we know from Scripture that God is gracious and kind, abounding in loving kindness. We see that displayed before us every day of our lives. Even right now, this moment, this morning, a beautiful day we have here this September morning, soon to be September afternoon. This testifies to the graciousness and the mercy of God. The graciousness and the mercy of God. One carries with it the positive aspect and the other carries with it the negative. What I mean by that is grace speaks to the fact that God gives us that which we do not deserve. And then mercy, mercy speaks to the idea that God holds back from us that which we do deserve. God holds back His wrath from us, His judgment upon us. Also, when we consider who God is, Scriptures also say that He is omnipotent. He is all-powerful. There is nothing apart. There's, there's nothing that He cannot do. He can do all things. And as we considered just a moment ago, He is holy. God is a holy God. And that word holy means set apart, sanctified. He is set apart from this evil world that we live in and from our perversion, our corruption, our imperfection. And He dwells, as the Bible says, in, in, in unapproachable light. Unapproachable light, friends. That is why the Bible could say it is a terrifying thing to fall into the hands of the living God. In fact, Jesus told His disciples to fear God, to fear the Lord. A lot of these attributes stand in direct opposition to the God of the Southerners. See, a lot of people here in the South, growing up in church have a false idea of who God is. They view Him as this cosmic grandfather who just bestows blessing upon everyone who doesn't have wrath, who doesn't have judgment, and who certainly does not send the sinner to hell. But Scripture says God is the one who destroys the soul in hell. God is the one who renders judgment, friends. God is holy. A holy God. The most righteous of men, the most righteous of saints, cannot approach Him. In fact, Moses in Exodus 33 prayed to God 
show me your glory. And God gave a very interesting response to Moses. In Exodus 33, verse 18, it says, Then Moses said, I pray you, show me your glory. Verse 19, and he said, I myself will make all my goodness pass before you and will proclaim the name of the Lord before you and I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious and will show compassion on whom I show compassion. But he said, you cannot see my face for no man can see me and live. The significance of this verse is profound indeed. Friends, God says to Moses, who was in his day Without question, one of the most righteous men to have walked the earth, even in history, when we look throughout all of history, Moses was one of the most righteous men to ever walk the earth, and God says to him, you cannot see me and live. You're going to die if you stand before me. And we think, and you think in your sin, friends, that you can stand before God. You need imputed righteousness, friends. You need to be wrapped in the righteousness of Christ. To stand before God. In our own filthy garments of sin, we cannot stand before the holy tribunal of God in our filth. We will be punished and eternally lost. God is so holy. He is so set apart. We, we really don't understand this inherently. We've lost this concept of God in our fallen state. Because we are born into sin, because we are born into this corruption, into this deadness to sin, we are slaves to sin, and we are slaves to idolatry, and so our minds automatically begin to create a God who suits our own desires and our own passions and our own lusts, and who is not the God of Scripture. And friends... I want to tell you something about God. In His holiness and in His righteousness, He gave His law. He gave His Ten Commandments for the children of men to obey. It is His moral law. And He gave that to us to show us a couple of things. The, the law of God has a couple of purposes, my friends. One of them, firstly, is that it shows us the character of God. The Ten Commandments show us the character of God, who God is. And this, the, these commandments are the, are the standard by which God judges sinners. And so when we read there in Romans 2.11 when it says there is no partiality with God, we, we know that what God is judging according to is His law, is His Ten Commandments. Just as a judge here on earth, here in Lawrence County, would judge according to the law of the land here in this county, so too does, does God judge according to His commandments. He Himself has said in Exodus 20, that you shall not murder, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal, you shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. And earlier in the chapter, he said, you shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself an idol or any likeness of what is in heaven above or on the earth beneath or in the water under the earth. You shall not worship them or serve them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children on the third and the fourth generations of those who hate me. God is so holy. We see it in His commands. Those are just a few of the commandments that God gave us. And they, they speak to the character of God. They show us who God is. Consider for a moment where God says you shall not murder. Why does God say that? Because He's not a murderous God. You shall not commit adultery. You shouldn't cheat on your spouse. You should not be unfaithful to your spouse. Why? Because God is a, a perfect, faithful, covenant-keeping God. Why does God say you shall not steal? God is not a thief. He owns all things. He has the right and the prerogative to tell us what we ought to do and how we ought to treat other people's property. Verse 16, you shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. You shall not lie. That's what that is in an effect. And the book of Hebrews tells us that God is an impossibility for God to lie. And so these commands show us the character of God. They show us the glory of God. That's why in Romans 3, 23 it says, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. What that text is saying there is that we've broken God's law, which is a reflection of the glory of God. We've fallen short of that. We missed the mark. And there's not much I have to say here concerning this, for you know it in your own conscience. You know that you've sinned against God. God has given you a conscience, which is Latin for with knowledge. 
He has given you knowledge. He has placed within you knowledge of right and wrong, and you know it. You know your guilt before God, friends. I need not go into great detail to show you your guilt, but I will briefly overlook it, or overview it, excuse me. You shall not commit idolatry. How many of us worship other things? How many of you worship other things that you ought not? You put things before the Lord as, as you ought not do. Or you create a God in your own mind who suits your own desires. Or you worship another God, a foreign God who is not the God of glory. Surely these sins are, are heinous in the eyes of God, are, are perverse and wicked. Or have you murdered? You may say, I have never murdered. We'll stop right there, friend. Jesus said in Matthew 5, He equated anger in, in one's heart toward, uh, toward a brother or sister, your, your neighbor, with murder. God sees the mind, friends. He sees the heart. And so even if you've exercised anger, unjustified anger, or hatred towards someone before, God sees you as a murderer at, in your heart and in your mind. You shall not commit adultery. Again, you say, I've been faithful to my spouse. I've never cheated on them. Well, friends, I want to ask you this. Do you think that that is all God sees, is the outward actions? No, God looks at the heart. And you know what He sees? He sees perversion and evil. Jeremiah 17.9 tells us, The heart is more deceitful than all else and is desperately sick. Who can understand it? See, friends, Jesus said in Matthew 5, that if you look at a woman with lust, or for you ladies, if you look at a man with lust, you commit adultery in the heart. And so God sees you as an adulterer in your heart and your mind. Oh, friends, we do not grasp the holiness of God. We do not grasp the justice of God. Friends, you must, you must get this. You must understand this. Let the law of God break up your heart. Let it crush you. Let the weight of your sin weigh you down. Let it break your heart. Let the hoe of God's law till up the soil of your soul, friends, that you might be ready to receive the gospel of grace, the seed of eternal life. Verse 15, you shall not steal. Are any thieves here today? Then you are sinners in the eyes of God for your thievery. And lastly, you shall not bear false witness. You shall not lie. How many of us have lied? Oh, I know that I have in my life. And the book of Revelation says all liars will have their place in the lake of fire. Oh, friends, so just considering a few of God's commands, we see that we ourselves are idolaters, are murderers, are adulterers, are thieves, and are liars. And that is not even all of God's Ten Commandments that He has given us. Oh, friends, our guilt before God is great indeed. A great guilt do we have before our Creator. And friends, that is not even all of the bad news. The news is much worse than that because in our guilt and in our sin we deserve punishment. Just as a rapist or a murderer here in South Carolina deserves to be punished for his or her sin or her, his or her law-breaking, I should say, so too do we deserve to be punished for our law-breaking. No one ever contends when a murderer or a rapist is sent to prison for, their, for the rest of their life because they broke the law. And yet people have problem with God judging the wicked. God is much more holy and much more righteous than any judge here on this earth. And His judgments are far greater and far more pure and far more unbiased. And so we ask ourselves, well, therefore, what is God's judgment for sin? Well, quite simply, it is the wrath of God. But specifically speaking, Jesus said this about, God, about the punishment for sin. He said it is a place called hell. This may shock you, friends, but Jesus spoke more on hell than He did about heaven. He preached more about the wrath of God coming upon the wicked than He did about heavenly glory because He wanted to warn sinners. Jesus loved sinners, and so He came to warn them. Think about if you were walking down the street about to step into a house that was on fire and at any moment could collapse. Hey, John. You can stay. I'll take you home. Okay. And you're walking into this house. It's about to collapse on you. I would be a fool and I would be filled with hatred if I didn't 
cry out to you and say, don't step into this house and burn. The most loving thing that I could do is cry out to you and say, don't step into this house and burn. And so friends, I know from Scripture that you are headed for a place of fiery torment for eternity. And friends, I care enough for you to stand out here on a sidewalk in the heat and say, flee the wrath of God which is to come. Don't lose your soul for your sins, but flee to Christ for eternal life. Be born from above, friends. Both you who are young and you who are old, flee to the Savior, Christ the Lord. God bless you, ma'am. Jesus had so much to say concerning hell. In fact, we get most of what we understand about hell from the lips of the Lord Jesus Christ. No other person in all, all of Scripture had more to say about it than He did. One of the things He said about hell was in Matthew 25, 46. He said simply this. He said this concerning the wicked. These will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. The wicked will go into the place that is in a place of eternal punishment. Hell is never ending, friends. It continues on and on and on because our guilt before God is so great and God's wrath revealed against us in our sin is infinite. Hell is a place that is eternal and it continues on. The torments of the wicked continue on forever. Also, Jesus said in Mark chapter 9, verse 43, listen to what He said about hell. He said, if, you, if your hand causes you to stumble, cut it off. It is better for you to, to enter life crippled than having two of your hands to go into hell, into the unquenchable fire, where the worm does not die and the fire is not quenched. If your foot causes you to stumble, cut it off. For it is better for you to enter life lame than having your two feet to be cast into hell where the worm does not die and the fire is not quenched. If your eye causes you to stumble, throw it out. It is better for you to enter the kingdom of God with one eye than having two eyes to be cast into hell, where the worm does not die and the fire is not quenched. Jesus described hell in these other terms. He said it is a place of weeping and gnashing of teeth. It is a place of outer darkness for the wicked. Hell is real, my friends, just as real as heaven is real. And I do not want you to go there in your sins. Flee to Christ today, friends. Look to the Lord Jesus Christ. As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, so that whoever believes will in Him have eternal life. Please don't lose your soul. You can lose money. You can lose possessions. And you can lose health in this life. But all can be regained. But once you lose your soul, it cannot be regained. Once it is gone, it is gone eternally. And there is no stepping back. There is no backtracking once one loses their soul. Oh, the, the sighs of the damned. Let the cries of the, of the tormented souls in hell move you to repent. Consider the moans and the screams of those, the shrieks of those who are receiving the justice of God upon their sin right now in the place of torment. The many millions of souls that have been lost because of their sin. Consider their torture. Consider their torment, friends. And let that move you to repent. And look to the Lord Jesus Christ. And so we find ourselves having be been condemned to this place of torment without any hope in and of ourselves. And as I said earlier, no amount of good deeds can outweigh the bad. In fact, they do nothing to change our guilt before God. It would be like, for example, a murderer saying to a judge here in South Carolina, well, listen, judge, you can forgive me. You can let me out of this courtroom. Let me go home and I won't be punished because... I helped an old woman cross the street, or I gave to charity, or I donated blood. See, it does not matter. The judge is going to say, it doesn't matter what you've done good. You have sinned. You've broken the law, and you must be punished for your law breaking. And with God, it is the same way. God is just, and He doesn't consider the good deeds. Because that is not what we are being judged for. You will stand before God. If you're outside of Christ, you'll stand before God and be judged for your wicked deeds. 
And no matter how many layers of righteousness you have upon it, it does not matter. God's eyes cut deep and they see the core. They see your sin and your filth. And so, friends, we are truly without any hope in and of ourselves. Without any hope in and of ourselves. It is a hopeless state that we are in. And God is just to give us such a punishment. However, I, my friends, I can say this with great joy, for Holy Scripture testifies to it from both Genesis to Revelation and everywhere in between that Jesus Christ came into the world to save sinners. Christ is the Savior. The Gospel message is that Jesus Christ saves from sin. The Gospel is not, God has a wonderful plan for your life. The Gospel is not, God wants you to be happy and healthy and wealthy. That's not the Gospel. The Gospel of Jesus Christ is that Jesus Christ saves sinners. That is the Gospel of grace. Don't be deceived by the, by the so-called preachers on TV and by many pastors here in this county. The Gospel is that Jesus Christ saves sinners. That is the Gospel of grace. In fact, listen to what Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians 15. He said, verse 1, Now I make known to you, brethren, the Gospel which I preach to you, which you also received, in which also you stand, by which also you are saved, if you hold fast the word which I preach to you, unless you believed in vain. For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that He was buried, and that He was raised on the third day according to the Scriptures. Friends, I do not hear anything from this text speak to health or wealth or prosperity or anything about God having a wonderful plan for anyone's life. The wonderful plan of God is that Jesus Christ came into the world to die a bloody death upon a cross and to be raised on the third day. That is what the Bible describes in, in, in 1 Corinthians 1.18 as the power of God. It is the, the life-changing power of God, friends. When the fullness of the times came, Jesus Christ came into the world and took upon Himself flesh, became man, truly God and truly man. And He came and lived a perfect life of obedience to the law of God. He obeyed the commands of God perfectly. In fact, He said this in Matthew 5, 17, Do not think that I came to abolish the law of the prophets. I did not come to abolish, but to fulfill. He came to fulfill the law of God that we broke. God bless you, sir. He came and lived in submission to the commands. You shall not lie. You shall not steal. You shall not dishonor your parents. He lived in submission. Perfect submission and perfect fulfillment of these laws on behalf of His people. He came and fulfilled our righteousness on behalf of the church. Friends, this is the glory of the Gospel. Jesus Christ lived the life that we are required to live but cannot live in and of ourselves. And He did it on behalf of His people, His elect. And He laid Himself down as the Lamb of God. He laid Himself down willingly and took upon Himself the guilt of His people. Took upon Himself their guilt and their filth and their sin. He was beat and whipped and spat upon. And He was nailed to a cross and hung upon that cross for those hours in agony. In agony, He suffered for His people. The Bible describes it as He took upon Himself the wrath of the Father. The eternal wrath of God was placed on Christ. The infinite wrath of the Father was unleashed upon Jesus Christ the Son. That is the love of God, friends. That's the love that God showed sinners in His Son, Jesus Christ. That is the great love. And yet it also shows us the justice and the holiness of God that He does not overlook sin. That He does not sweep sin under the rug, but He publicly punishes it. He publicly and justly punishes it. In fact, in Romans chapter 3, in Romans chapter 3, 
Verse 25, the Apostle Paul said this concerning the death of Jesus Christ, whom God displayed publicly as a propitiation in His blood through faith. This was to demonstrate His righteousness because in the forbearance of God, He passed over the sins previously committed. The cross of Jesus Christ was a display of the righteousness of God against sin. That He Himself deals with sin in justice. And that confirms the text of Scripture that we considered earlier out of Romans 2. That there is no partiality with God. And so, as He hung upon that cross in agony, something glorious was happening. His soul was in anguish, as Isaiah 53 says. And as Isaiah 53, 10 reads, it pleased the Lord to crush Him. When He cried out at that cross, to tell us die, it is finished. The wrath of God against sin was satisfied. The wrath of the Father against sin was put away. And there was not an ounce, not a drop left for the people of God to bear. Christ bore the curse of the law upon Himself and satisfied the wrath of God. I love how the hymn puts it. So on that cross where Jesus died, the wrath of God was satisfied. And so He did die indeed. And after three days in the tomb, He was raised from the grave. The Father rose Him up as the public display that He had received His sacrifice at the cross as sufficient payment for the sins of His people. That He had truly satisfied the wrath of God. There was significance in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. That is why Paul could write in Romans 4.25 that Christ was raised because of our justification. And He is alive today, never to die again. Never shall death have any power over Him. For He puts death in subjection under His feet. That is why Jesus said in John 14, 6, He said, I am the way and the truth and the life. No man comes to the Father but through me. And after 40 days of further ministry among His disciples, He was then exalted into glory. He was received into heaven at the right hand of the Father, at the right hand of the throne of God on high. He was received into... God bless you. He was received into celestial glory. Hey John, that was my family. And He has done the work of salvation already. He has completed it once for all. It is finished. He is high priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. And He reigns as Lord and as King of the universe. And the command unto you and to you and to you, my friends, the command unto the wicked is to flee your sin, to repent. Jesus Himself said in Mark chapter 1, he said these words in verse 15, The time is fulfilled, and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. Friends, those two things is what you must do. You must repent. You must flee your sin. Turn from your selfishness and your self-righteousness. Turn from your sexual immorality and your drunkenness. And Turn to Christ. Believe the message of the Gospel. Believe that God is gracious enough to pardon you of your sins. To cleanse you and to adopt you as one of His children through the precious blood of His Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Through the precious blood of the Lamb of God which was, which was shed at the cross of Calvary. And when one believes that Gospel message, 
When one truly repents and believes upon Christ alone for eternal life. See, friends, you must flee all self-confidence, all trust in your religious performance, all trust in any church or any pastor or priest that might help you. And your hope must be fully in Jesus Christ, who is the great high priest, who is the King of glory. And when you do that, God, God bless you, sir. God will pardon you of your sins. You will be cleansed of every last one of your transgressions on account of the atoning work of Jesus Christ. On account of the cross of Jesus Christ. You will be pardoned of all your sin as a gift of grace. And the sinner will be given perfect righteousness. Perfect righteousness in Jesus Christ. The Father will look upon the sinner as if they had lived the life of Jesus Christ. Because He looked at Christ as if He lived their life. That's the exchange of the Gospel, my friends. Jesus takes my sin and I receive His righteousness, friends. I receive His righteousness as a free gift of grace. Friends, you need perfect righteousness to stand before God and you don't have it in yourself. I don't have it in myself. And it has to come from someone else. And it comes from Jesus Christ. That is why Romans chapter 4 verse 5 says, But to the one who does not work, but believes in Him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is credited as righteousness. The Father gives to the sinner perfect righteousness. Jesus takes my sin and I get His righteousness as a gift of grace. I'm wrapped in the garments of the righteousness of Christ. Friends, this is all of grace. All of God's unmerited favor. All out of the love of God. Friends, you need this or else you'll be damned to hell for your sins. Please, put your trust in the finished work of Jesus Christ and be saved from your sins. Father, help me. Father, help me, please. You'll be saved from your sins forever. And as I said, it is all of the grace of God, all of the mercy of God, does this salvation come about. All out of the free grace of God. And so, friends, this is truly a glorious salvation. That is why the book of Hebrews says, how can we neglect so great a salvation? How can we turn away from so great a salvation? Friends, this is the greatest deal you will ever behold. Friends, flee to Christ for eternal life. Flee your sins. It's all of grace. All out of the grace of God. That's why Ephesians 2 says, For by grace have you been saved through faith. And that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not as a result of works, so that no one may boast. And friends, the genuinely converted person, the genuinely converted soul, will be forever changed. This salvation changes the nature of man. It is being born from above, being recreated. Friends, you must be made new. You must be regenerated by the Holy Spirit. You must be born from on high, friends. Jesus Himself said in John 3.3, 3, Unless a man is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. And what is the end to all this? It is the glory of God. It is the glory of God, friends. This great salvation is all to the end that God might receive praise and might receive honor and might receive exaltation. It is all by grace so that God gets all the glory. That is why Paul himself wrote in Romans 11, verse 33. Or actually, I'll, I'll begin at verse 
34, who has known the mind of the Lord, or who became his counselor, or who was first given to him, that it might be paid back to him again. For from him, and through him, and to him are all things. To him be the glory forever. Amen. And amen and amen. Oh, you sinners, you lost souls, flee to Christ for eternal life. You, sir, and you, ma'am, flee to Christ. Repent of your sins and be saved. Be born from above. Do not, do not distract yourself with the cares of this life. And do not distract yourselves with the cares of this world which are passing away. But concern yourself with spiritual things. Concern yourself with the things of God. Repent and believe before it is too late. And you who are religious, you religious sinners and hypocrites, you need salvation. You vipers, flee to Christ. Flee to Him. Turn from your hypocrisy. Turn from your pride. And look to Christ. Look to Jesus Christ and live. Have eternal life in the Son of God who shed His blood at the cross. Who shed His blood on behalf of His elect. It does not matter how great your religious performance is. It does not matter how many prayers you have offered up to God or how many times you've read the Bible or how many times you've had a religious experience. You must be born again. You must be born from above. My friends, I, ex I stress the absolute importance of this because it is of necessity that you be born again. That you be born from on high. And even for you Christians, my dear brethren, I encourage you to rest upon the gospel message. It is our daily bread. It is the manna from heaven that God has supplied us with, that we might feed upon it. Preach this gospel to a lost and dying world. My friends, my dear Christian friends, be godly men and women and preach the gospel to all who you come in contact with, to the glory of God. And so, in closing, we have seen here in Romans 2, verse 11, that there is no partiality with God, that God deals justly and righteously with the children of men. And we have seen even in this sermon that God is holy and He has given His law but we have broken His law. We have trampled His commands underfoot. But, even though we are condemned to hell by default, God sent His Son Jesus to die and to be raised on the third day to save us from our sins. And all who look to Him will be saved from their sins eternally. To God be the glory indeed. To God be all glory and all honor and all praise and all things in your life and in mine, and in the preaching of the gospel of His Son, to God be the glory forever. Amen. Amen and amen.